Good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope you're all doing well at a very, very difficult time in our nation's history. A lot of us have, I know, had a very difficult time over Christmas, over New Year, uh, unable to be with our family, unable to be our loved ones at the very time of year that we would expect to, and particularly after a year like this, more than ever, that kind of love and 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 being able to be close to people we love is is more important than ever. And for millions of us, we've been able to because of the worst national crisis since World War II. Now, what we're going to do tonight, and this is very important, because this is the biggest national emergency since World War II. And it's something which has defined our lives now for the best part of a year. And there is still a long way to go, despite hope. We will talk about hope as well today. But it's a time which has left around 86,000 people dead, according to excess deaths. Uh, it's led to our hospitals increasingly being overwhelmed with more patients now with COVID in our nation's hospitals than during the first wave. Uh, we've got the economic and social turmoil that's gone with it. Now, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to stick to the facts. And before I'll, I'll introduce the guests shortly, but it's very important I say that because the two guests who I'm going to introduce have no other agenda whatsoever other than speaking the facts, the truth about what's happening to our hospitals, what's happening to our country, what's happening in the pandemic. And these are truths which many of those in power don't want you to know for a very simple reason, that the consequences of their decisions, the policies they have implemented or failed to implement, are the reason we're now in this mess. And it was always going to be a national trauma, but it never needed to be this bad. And that's so important to know, given we are one of the worst affected countries on the face of the earth. This wasn't some simple natural disaster, but the consequences of government policy. So before I introduce the guests, just a very quick bit of housekeeping. If you've not already subscribed, below press subscribe, press the notifications bell, uh, button, the bell, so you'll always get notifications in future, so you know when these videos are happening. For those of us who've supported this video channel, which has now been around for a month and a half, and we've done so many uh, interviews with a whole range of different guests and documentaries about what's happening in the world around us. Thank you for your support. If you want to support us, go to Patreon slash Owen Jones 84. If you want to submit questions tonight, use Super Chat. You'll be able to support this show and the, the workers we have on union wages who are keeping this going. Uh, and you can go to press the, 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 the money sign below the chat uh, and you can press that and you can support, give whatever you need, whatever you want, and that will help support the channel, but also put questions uh, to our guests. Now, I'm going to bring them in because the last thing you want to hear now is me. You want to hear the experts. So I'm going to bring in, firstly, uh, Dr. Deepti Gurdasani, who's a clinical epidemiologist, uh, who, and please do follow on Twitter because during this pandemic, if you want to get very reliable sources about what's happening I think that does a huge amount of good when there are informed discussions. So DT is one. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And thank you for having me. And let's bring in as well uh, Sonia Adesara, who's an NHS doctor, who's actually there on the front line during this uh, pandemic. Please again, follow her on, on Twitter, on social media, because you'll get a huge amount of wisdom and insight, often lacking in the media. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Erin. Happy New Year, as happy a year uh, as as this can be. I hope your period over over Christmas was uh, was was as relaxed as it possibly could be. Of course, it won't be with you uh, in particular, Sonia, but both of you at the moment, very 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 much at the centre of this of this national crisis. So let's just go straight into it. Let's just get straight into this. How serious is this current winter crisis? Should we start with you, Sonia, in terms of comparing the current situation with the first wave. So, of course, that period between March, April, May, how would you compare the two? So I think we, particularly over the past two weeks, um, we are seeing more COVID admissions now than we were in the first wave. Um, we are also seeing more... So in the first wave, it was, it was strange because our, we were very busy from COVID admissions, but then everything else just fell by the wayside and people weren't coming into hospital. Actually, it was quite bad because we know that, you know, heart attacks were getting missed, strokes were getting missed. Um, but now we're also still extremely busy with admissions from non-COVID admissions. So I'd say um, maybe like half half medical admissions are from people with, with 
who are sick and need treatment need to be in hospital but they don't have covid um so just generally hospital admissions are um higher than they were in the first wave um our hospital is much fuller than it was in the first wave um we are struggling more you know despite the fact that we've you know my hospital we've been like trebled our critical care capacity um we have we're struggling with intensive care capacity we're struggling with cpap capacity um so it feels more critical than it was in the first wave um it does also feel that we are seeing more um younger patients coming in than the first wave um and then i think i guess a, a real crucial difference is that actually you know compared to the first wave when we didn't really know what we were doing um now we know how to treat covid we know how to manage patients we know how to support them with their breathing we also know how to you know prevent and treat complications of covid so we we know what to do and we can actually we can support people and for the majority of people coming into hospital we can treat them we can get them better we can get them home and i think that's what's becoming you know particularly stressful because you know we are concerned that we are very much on the verge where we won't have that capacity to treat everyone that needs treating um and that's i think what's quite you know frightening for many healthcare professionals on the front line um and then i guess the other difference is you know in the first wave there was that you know we were all in this together you know as a country there was that real sort of morale and in the nhs staff we were i guess you know there was this you know we were getting food sent in every day you know the nhs collapsed all these things you know we were we had i think a bit more of a um morale boost then whereas i feel like now i think staff are exhausted um staff are you know frustrated people are on the verge of burnout um because we've been dealing with this now for you know <laughs> over eight months um so I think, and 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 I guess, but we're also still having staff get COVID like they did in the first wave. We're still having quite severe staff shortages, staff having to isolate. Um, so I guess there are similarities there, but it does feel more um, more critical um, and it feels more difficult this time around. I mean, Dita, you've been looking at a lot of the numbers and I've seen you sharing a lot of the numbers. How would you look if you're looking as an epidemiologist looking at this wave compared to what we went through earlier this year? So I think it's actually really, really worrying because in terms of cases, you know, we've seen a rapid rise. We know that for many days now, the cases have been above 50,000. Hospitalizations have now actually gone beyond what we had in the peak in April. And what we need to remember is at the point of the peak in April, we had already locked down. So that was sort of uh, a lagged effect from the point of lockdown where hospitalizations kept rising for a while after lockdown and um, then started declining. Whereas now we've actually superseded that peak, but we haven't locked down, which means that things will get worse for the next two to three weeks. Um, and of course, we know that with the impact of the new variant that's spreading across England, the situation is very likely to get even worse. Um, I think we're also in a very different position, I think, as Sonia mentioned, because uh, in the beginning, you know, we saw very high compliance with lockdown. People were motivated because there was an end in sight, whereas now we're looking at, um, you, you know, people who are exhausted, stressed uh, and, and overwhelmed health service where routine services have been uh, kind of on, on um, waiting for a really long period of time, even before we went into this. So. Uh, it's really disappointing that we're in this position, despite having had several key advantages. Uh, we know so much more about the virus now. We know so much more um, uh, about how to care for people with the virus and how to prevent, uh, you know, the surges in cases that we're seeing now. So it looks like we knew that this wave was coming, but we did very little to prepare for it. And we're actually now in a position that's much worse than we were in the first wave. Um, I mean, before we go as well, it's very important, of course, we look at how we ended up in this situation. In terms of going forward, and by the way, thanks for those super stickers. If you want to also put questions to our guests, put them as uh, super chats, and I will read out everybody at the end who who who, who sends those in. Um, yeah, I mean, Sonia, in terms of in terms of at the moment, the sorts of decisions doctors will have to make, and there's been reports, for example, in the Guardian about those about, for example, cancer patients and the sorts of uh, different, you know, in terms of thing appointments, treatment potentially being delayed, cancelled as a consequence. What kind of decisions do you fear that doctors will have to be making in hospitals in the coming days and weeks? Um, so I think a decision that we will all fear is if we get to the point where we have um, more than one patient needing to be needing needing a bed on ITU or we have more than one patient needing needing CPAP um, 
and we will only have we don't have the capacity to support all of them and um, so that's you know just an absolute I can't even even think about it. it's an absolutely horrific position to be in we are close to that um so in my hospital for the past set of you know I've been doing night shifts over the past couple of weeks um and we've been at max you know maximum I2 capacity maximum CPAP capacity over those shifts um and over many of these nights we had you know maybe one ITU bed become free and then there'll be three patients that are really sick and who need that ITU bed um we still at the moment so my hospital is very full but we're still in the position you know I work in London but but we're in the position where other hospitals in London do have free capacity so if we do if we're at one point where we critically need um patients to be intubated and we don't have space we can transfer them out to another hospital um but if we get to the position where you know i2 capacity is maxed out in all the hospitals in london then we find ourselves in an extremely difficult position that none of us want to be in where we're essentially having to choose you know who 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 can get the care and who can't um and that's you know just a position we can't let ourselves get into that position because it's just it's you know it's utterly horrific um, and then what you know what you mentioned about cancer care you know unfortunately this has happened in my hospital and it's probably going to happen in most hospitals now but already having to cancel um you know routine care routine operations you know surgeries and I think I think people don't really understand the sometimes the impact of that when we're talking about you know I can give you an example of you know my, my uncle his surgery was cancelled in the first wave and um, it's now been cancelled again because of the second wave now you know his surgery it was cancelled because it's not seen as life-threatening but actually he's become more and more disabled over the past year because he's not had that surgery and um, so you know for there is an immense amount of harm that that is happening because we're having to essentially cancel everything else to try and clear out our beds to try and have space to make sure that we literally don't run out of hospital beds and don't run out of capacity um, and you know at the moment we're trying to keep cancer care open um, but you know there is an inevitable harm that happens when um when we're having to sort of limit what we can do um so it's a difficult position to be in and i think and with all these things it's we shouldn't really be having to make these decisions um and you know it's it's not a very good place to be in that we that we're already in this situation um, and as dipti said this is going to get worse over the next couple of weeks um, because we know at the moment hospital admissions are more than what it was at the peak of the first wave and cases are still increasing um, so we will still start to see an increase in admissions over the next few weeks so this is this situation will become more even more critical over the next few weeks i mean Sonia, can i also ask in terms of nhs staff who are obviously under huge amounts of pressure what what impact is that having at the moment in terms of emotional stress but also burnout because that does have consequences doesn't it yeah, I think um, you know, you know, burnout. I guess burnout was actually a problem before you know COVID hit. We were already running a really overstretched service. Um, we were already pre-COVID, you know, running you know doctors and nurses having you know running on you know rotors that unfilled. Um, we already had a quite a problem of um, staff not having enough staff to safely staff the service. Um, but it, yeah, it's become much more acute. Um, so, you know, right every day I'm getting messages from my road coordinator saying, you know, please come in, please do extra shifts. But we were already running, working long shifts. Um, but we're having to, you know, and this is from junior level to consultant level, you know, across different different professions in the NHS. Everyone is working extra hours. You know, a lot of people have cancelled their leave and people are coming in on their rest days. Um, but that will have, you know, a long term impact, I think, on staff. Um, and as you say, you know, on burnout and it's and it's not sustainable. And I think, you know, you can do it in the short term, but you can't do that in the long term. Um, and it feels like there's, you know, you know, we don't really see the end in sight at the moment. Um, and even, you know, you know, vaccinating staff again, it's not really happening at, you know, at the rate that we'd like to see it. You know, mo majority of NHS workers have not been vaccinated. So people are still getting the virus. People are getting the virus more than once. Um, and we're having to, and also, I guess, as the rates of the virus go up in the community, people are also getting the virus in the community as well and having to isolate. So, um, yeah, the answer to the question is burnout is, I think, is high at the moment. And we will continue to see the impacts of that, you know, over the next few months, over the years. Um, and surveys that have been done, you know, I think the Royal College of Nursing did a survey which showed, you know, a lot of a lot of NHS nurses are can't see themselves continuing to work in the NHS after that, which I think is really, um, you know, really sad. Um, and I think something you know, that needs to be addressed now. 
Um, DT, I mean, in terms of the new variant, I mean, it's interesting, I think, just showing the breakdown of trust that has happened between much of the population and the government. There was a bit of eye rolling it first, a kind of, oh, isn't this terribly convenient? Uh, they've let this get out of control and they're blaming it on new variants. So I just want to be clear just how serious is this new variant? And a question we had sent in by Foxy, and do keep those super chats coming. Why, after a year of almost a year of COVID and over 70,000 UK deaths, do we still have people either denying the existence of COVID or downplaying the severity of it? How have the government got the message so wrong? So the new variant, unfortunately, is extremely severe. I think I had the same doubts that many people had um, about, because I think, you know, there is lost interest with government, as you said, among the public and among scientists. But the evidence actually really backs that this variant is far more transmissible than the current variant. And uh, it's about 50 to 75% more transmissible, which makes controlling it much harder so just to provide an example of that, we know that uh, during the last lockdown, when schools were open, but other strict restrictions were in place, the previous variant was spreading with an R number of 0.9, which means cases were declining, whereas this particular variant was spreading at a rate of 1.5, which meant that cases were tripling every two to three weeks. So that really tells you that uh, the regular restrictions or the re regular measures that we put in place to control COVID need to be much more robust to be able to get on top of the pandemic now because of the spread of this variant. And, you know, until a few weeks ago, this variant was mainly dominant in Southeast England uh, and, and not so prevalent in other parts of England and other parts of the UK. But now we know that it's spread across England at least and Wales, um, which means that the situation is likely to get worse. Um, regarding your, your second question about the level of misinformation around this and the disbelief, um, I think scientists are also struggling with that. I think a lot of this comes down to the government messaging from very early on, which has been uh, inconsistent, has minimized the risk of COVID many, many times. It's raised expectations that were over-optimistic and were then not met. And all of this has really undermined public trust to a point where now when we need to get the message across that we need a collective and serious pandemic response because we're in a very dire situation, it's very difficult to take the public along with us. Uh, I think this gap that the government has left in um, public messaging has very unfortunately been filled in by a lot of disinformation and by proponents of disinformation that are actually backed by vested interests, unfortunately, much like um, a lot of the um, a lot of the messaging we've seen in elections and Brexit and other political issues. And it's quite rampant now on social media, the spread of conspiracy theories and fake news. And it's very, very hard to counter when there isn't any public trust in government and when the co there is no communication about why policies are being put in place. Uh, Sonia, and thanks for that question, Josh. I'll, I'll come on to the question. Uh, we'll talk about schools and measures um, later on. But Sonia, in, in terms of when you see skeptics on social media or in the media, let's be honest, not just social media, but, but promoted by media outlets, and you have to see the consequences in hospitals, how do you feel? And also, I mean, there is an issue, I don't know what your take on this is, about journalists being able to get into hospitals. And there's been a bit of confusion about this, you know, because I suppose in a pandemic like this, for most people, it seems as though life is relatively normal other than the lockdown. They're not see they're not there on the front line, whereas it's in the hospital that the consequences are, are concentrated. But people can't see that. They're not seeing on their screens what's actually happening in hospitals. I mean, I don't know if you've got any take on that about the ability of journalists to be able to film or take pictures of what's happening in, in hospitals and whether or not the authorities are allowing that to happen. Um, well, I guess... In your answer to your first question of how I feel, um, I remember I think it was Boxing Day morning. I, you know, it was at the, it was my la my last patient of a night shift, so I was you know at that point I was pretty um, tired. And um, and there was a lady that came in, um, very unwell. She was needing sort of the highest flow oxygen that we could give through a normal mask, and she was someone that I was thinking probably would need CPAP. Um, and it first of all, it, she refused to have a COVID swab. Um, and then in the end, my sort of my consultant essentially, a &E consultant essentially sort of de demanded that she had it. Um, so it took us about an hour for, for us before we could get a swab of her, which came back positive. So then I went and told her that like, you've got COVID. Um, and she just adamantly 
wouldn't believe me um and she was just refusing to believe in and she started saying things like you know i've read up about this and she was and she was saying all the things that i'd seen in social media you know all the sort of the conspiracy theories um and i was just i couldn't and it was just i found it really upsetting i was like i think it was of course quite tired but i just thought you know this woman could die um and yet she is you know refusing treatment refusing to believe that covid was real and um, and and believe that we the doctors were part of this conspiracy theory um and you know how many people you know but you know how many people right now in in the in the population are not following the guidelines um putting themselves at risk putting other people at risk because of these conspiracy theories that are online um, and i find that really really frightening um and frustrating and you know i think it's just today i was on i was on twitter i feel like i should get off twitter because it makes me so angry but i saw um esther mcveigh who is a conservative party politician um mp and um, someone with a big twitter following someone who would be trusted by many people put out a tweet essentially comparing covid to flu which is you know we know covid is not flu you know covid has a much higher mortality rate than flu you know we've been dealing with flu in the nhs for many many years and yet we you know and I can tell you, as someone that works in NHS, COVID is very, very different. Um, it kills many more people. It kills a lot younger people. Um, and it's much has a much higher mortality and morbidity rate than flu. And yet, you know, we are 10 months down the line and we still have people who, with big social media followings, people who are trusted by, you know, large segments of the politic, um, large segments of the public, putting out um, these sort of, things that are just factually incorrect. Um, and then I guess adding to this, um, adding to the sort of, you know, the the, the, the mistrust um, that, that that the public are having, you know, about for um, about COVID and, and you know, creating just mistrust um, from, our, from our scientists and our um, healthcare professionals. Um, so it is really frustrating. Um, and I think, you know, the media has a part to play when they put people, um, when they give platforms to people, you know, people like Professor Sakura, Sakura or um, you know, sort of COVID deniers, and and give them sort of legitimacy, and you know, as if what they they represent some part of the scientific community when they actually don't, you know, sort of ninety nine point nine percent of the scientific community, you know, are very much on the same page around COVID, um, and yet they're sort of presented as as if they are, you know, as if their view is is equal to I guess the rest of the scientific community, um, without actually media going into hospitals, um. I can understand why that's difficult. You know, I personally don't know how I'd feel if I was, you know, to see people with cameras walking around my hospital. Um, but I think actually, you know, if there wasn't so much mistrust and, and you know, being created right now, I think people would, would believe, you know, we have enough doctors, you know, going on the media saying what's happening. You've got the statistics, you can see the numbers. Um, so there really shouldn't be so much, you, you, can, you can see the death rates, you know, so uh, you know, I don't really understand why people don't seem to believe the situation is serious. You know, we really are, um, you know, thousands of people are dying, are dying. So <laughs> it's it's real. <laughs> I mean, on that, no, it's, it's striking actually that Andrew Neil, who is a former flagship BBC interviewer, he's the chairman of the Spectator magazine, uh, and as someone who is on his social media, certainly questioned uh, lockdown measures and and suggested Sweden was a model people could be following but he i mean for example he challenged uh the bbc today on its questioning of boris johnson saying another interview with the government in which the broadcaster's sole theme is why didn't you or don't you lock down sooner to offer longer now interestingly andrew neil and i say this because i think it is in you it is important to learn from history um during the hiv aids pandemic uh when he was editor of the sunday times the newspaper pushed the idea that HIV did not cause AIDS. And this was actually a theory which was promoted for a while, unfortunately, by the South African government. Um, so Neville Hodgkinson, the paper's then science correspondent, argued HIV didn't cause AIDS, and it was attribute to, attributable to the kinds of lifestyle uh, uh, that Sunday Times readers would disapprove of, as the New Statesman puts it. But interestingly, in the New, New York Times at the time condemned the Sunday Times for its coverage, um, and Kate O'Neill, who's quoted in the uh, New York Times in the mid-90s from the Terence Higgins Trust, which is an HIV charity, uh, saying the problem is they're not giving all the facts, which means they are misleading some and giving others false hope. That's what she said. And the science editor of the, of, of the Sunday Times said that the paper is serving the public interest by telling readers that serious scientists and researchers dissent strongly from the accepted view that HIV causes AIDS. 
Now, we look back at that and think, what on earth were these people thinking to even contemplate using their platform to doubt the link between HIV and AIDS? But there were dissenting scientists. There are always a tiny minority of dissenting scientists and experts. But the fact is, there is an overwhelming consensus on this, as there is on the climate emergency. And when media outlets portray it as, here's one side of the opinion, but here's another equally valid point, it, it's completely misleading to the public. Anyway, sorry, just to just back that up because it was something which was I found very frustrating. Um, Deedsy, just just in terms of on the, on uh, in terms of let's just be blunt about this. In terms of current case numbers, yeah. is the NHS going to be able to cope in what is already the most stressful time generally for the NHS? I think the simple answer to that is no. Um, so, um, you know, we already know that the NHS is overwhelmed. So we have about 24,000 people in hospital and we have about 2,000 people who are getting hospitalized every day. And this is at a point where case numbers are still rising. So we're nowhere near the peak. We are hearing stories uh, from hospitals about oxygen shortages, about having to make decisions about who to put on a ventilator. And we know how this goes. We know that ultimately this is going to translate to many, many more deaths, not just because of increased number of cases, but also because we're not able to manage the care in hospital that we would really like to do. And we saw this in it in the first wave where the rate of death among those hospitalized really rose because you know they were not able to provide the care that they needed because health services were completely overwhelmed um and you know as sonia said earlier we also have to think about the huge impact on healthcare workers because having to make these life and death decisions and choices that we don't normally have to make is extremely traumatic and we've already done such an awful job of looking after healthcare staff that I think it's really shocking given the situation we're in now that we really haven't taken appropriate action to stop this getting worse. I mean, uh, Sonia, on, on, on that, I mean, thanks, Quint Wolf, for your question. I, I, we're going to move on shortly to what we do in the future. So I'll, I'll raise, your, raise your question when we get to that point. I mean, do you think, Sonia, do you think your hospital will be able to cope in the coming weeks? So I think if we continue to see the increase in admissions that we've been seeing over the past fortnight, um, I don't think I don't think the NHS will be able to cope. Um, so London hospitals are already at the point where they're on the verge of being overwhelmed, um, and 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 I we know actually that even in in parts of the country where they've not seen that surge yet, you know, if we're talking about the north, um, they they hospitals are actually already at max capacity as well, and um, they're already very full. So I think. You know, this is going to be a problem for the for across the country. Um, so I can give you what's going on in my hospital right now. You know, we are um so we have, as I said, very few beds left. Um we are having to um in our A and E department, you know, we have I don't know if people have been to A and E, but normally you have like different cubicles where you have one patient per cubicle. We're having to put two, three patients per cubicle just to try and stop the um the queues of ambulances and try and allow free up space for ambulances to offload. Um when it comes to you know ITU capacity, you know, my last shift when when we had one bed became free on ITU, we had three patients that needed to go to ITU. So we essentially had to, you know, assess who was the most sick out of those very sick patients. Um, with with CPAP capacity again, you know we are on my last set of shifts. Shifts we were, we were using up all of our CPAP capacity. So CPAP is um, non-invasive ventilation. So when someone's struggling to breathe with just normal oxygen, we can put them on a CPAP machine to help them breathe. Um, it's sort of the stage before needing to be intubated. Um, and again, we we're sort of there were about you know I think about five patients who felt that they were they were on the maximum oxygen that we could give on a normal mask. Um, so they needed CPAP. Um, so we were essentially having to spend the shift, you know, monitoring all these patients, you know, doing blood tests very frequently, checking their oxygen levels, um, trying to work out who is the most sick and who, out of all of those. Um, and then monitoring all our CPAP patients, seeing who we could get off the CPAP machine. Um, and then essentially, as soon as one machine became free, we'd put another patient on it. Um, so we're very much, you know, we're sort of, we're, ma we're at max capacity. Um, and we don't have much spare capacity. Um, and, and as I said, my hospital has already stopped routine, operations, routine operations and routine care. So we are on that verge of going, of being overwhelmed. Um, 
you know, I know some hospitals in London that have got a bit more spare capacity. Um, but if we get to the point where all the hospitals don't have spare capacity, then that's a really um, critical situation that, you know, none of us really want to think about. Um, so yeah, you are. and then even not just hospitals as well, like ambulance services. I remember, you know, I was speaking to one of the ambulance workers on my last shift and she told me that there'd been a, there'd been a um, you know, a COVID patient who had been waiting for a few hours to come into hospital. She told me about another lady who had had a, an, an elderly lady who had, had a fracture of her femur. So she had a, you know, a serious, um, you know, a bone fracture of her leg and then was left for eight hours at home before the ambulance could come because the ambulance service was so overrun. Um, so, you know, all parts of the, of the service have been really overstretched um, and there is, um, there will inevitably be a lot of harm and suffering that happens as a result as we become more and more overstretched. Um, there's an, an interesting question from Itzy, thank you, which says, can you explain to people seasonal flu deaths are usually higher in a normal year than it is during COVID? And I think the reason that's important is that actually, in theory, that stress on the NHS has actually been reduced. Flu is less widespread for the very simple reason that we've been social distancing uh, and there's been a national lockdown. And despite that, we're still seeing an NHS which is overwhelmed because obviously flu season is generally when you get the pressures on the NHS in particular. And this other question from Foxy uh, about face masks, do you think there should not be any exemptions to wearing them in public um, so people who can't wear face masks must shelter? Who was to go on that? Do you want to start, DT on any of those? Are you those? Yeah, sure. I mean, I can understand uh, passing mandates on face masks, so making it mandatory in in uh, you know certain settings. I think there should still be exemptions. I think there are very legitimate reasons where some people may be unable to wear them because of trauma related to particular incidents, um, or because of feeling breathless. So I think we can't take away the exemptions, but certainly we can enforce mask wearing better and support mask wearing better with better communication and provision of masks. So I think those are the areas that we really need to stress as well as the information that masks are actually effective, which I think there is a huge amount of disinformation around. And there is a lot of skepticism around mask use. So I think those are the aspects that I think we need to address. I wouldn't take away the exemptions because to me that seems rather cruel because I think they're legitimate reasons for some people who may not be able to wear them. And 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 Sonia, what do you think about, for example, uh, what was that other question? I've just lost it now. What was the other question? It was on... Um... Oh, here we go. Yes, about seasonal flu. Sorry, seasonal flu uh, levels being lower. So you're seeing less flu patients, aren't you? But you're still under pressure. Yeah, so we, it's not just it's not just flu that we deal with in winter. Um, we deal with infections. We deal with um, you know people coming with falls, we, and then all the normal stuff. You know, strokes, heart attacks, um, you know, sepsis. Um, so all all of these things we we deal with, um, and they tend to just increase in the winter. Um, so, um, but yeah, flu flu is is. We are seeing less flu, um, I guess, just because of what you said, people are social distancing. Um, I think just to go back to the, to the mask question, actually, though, I, you know, I, I'm personally like, I'm not someone that I'm not pro mandating things. I think actually, if you educate people, um, generally, people want to look after themselves, people want to look after their loved ones, people don't want to, you know, you know, kill family members or hurt, kill people around them. But I think the problem is actually, I don't think it's necessarily about mandating. The problem is that there is so much myths um, and misinformation and going around, as Dipke said, like, you know, we've seen politicians' dads, you know, lots of photographs of certain politicians' dad, you know, not wearing his mask, um, not in, not to name names. So I think that's, that's the problem. I think it's not, you know, actually we do have, you know, mask wearing is mandated in shops and in public transport. And yet I still see a huge number of people not wearing their masks. Um, and actually once when I sort of gave someone a dirty look on the train, he started, started having a go at me. Um, and you could actually, there's a, it's, it's bizarre. I think there's a, there is a group of people who are seen sort of not wearing their mask as, as making like a political statement, um, which I find really, um, Again, it's sort of it's it's quite scary that there's sort of that there's this group of people, these sort of the anti-maskers who who really sort of fervently believe that they are they are doing the right thing by not wearing their masks. Um, and again, there's big people with big social media profiles who are promoting that as well. Um, let's talk about how we got here as well, and we're going to end after that by where where we go from here, basically. Um, so, for example, um, yeah, we'll come on to that. Anthony Coates got this question about 
uh, pandemic and NHS cuts, which we'll come on to. But how predictable was this win- was this winter crisis we're in? And how much was it due to decisions made? We know locking down. Locking down late had disastrous consequences because we locked down in this country when we had a higher infection rate than any other major European nation. So we had to lock down for longer as well. Um, but... You know, one study suggested if we locked down three days earlier, it could have saved 20,000 deaths for the simple reason that uh, the infection rates trebled every three days. Uh, and if it was a week earlier, about half the deaths could have been saved. But if we're going after that, we that's been well rehearsed. But in terms of the summer, because in the summer you buy time, you know, we know that lockdown, social distancing had an impact, warmer weather, people outdoors. What were the decisions that were made in that period which paved the way to where we are here? DT, do you want to go for that? Yeah, sure. It was completely predictable and not only was it predictable many scientists predicted it and spoke about it as early as may um, and asked the government to urgently make a plan for the summer and for autumn and winter because uh, we knew that there would be a surge happening particularly given the way the government dealt with it so for example you know you spoke about late lockdown but we also know that we ease lockdown much earlier and i don't mean that in terms of time but in terms of where we were in the pandemic in terms of our cases we were having very high numbers of cases when we started easing uh, lockdown much higher than in europe and when we started easing lockdown we went really really quickly and unfortunately we didn't use lockdown to really build a strategy for long-term sustenance of low case levels. So one of the key things that we needed to do during the first lockdown, which I think all scientists advised, was uh, set up a good test, trace, isolate, and support strategy. Um, And we started easing lockdown before we had that strategy in place. And we continue to ease very, very quickly without having an effective test, trace, and isolate system. And actually, if you look at the data, the cases started rising towards the end of July, August. So it was very clear the direction things were going in but action was only taken in October Um, so uh, I think it's really frustrating for most scientists because uh, there were numerous warnings about this numerous publications about this and recommendations around what needed to be done uh, to prevent a surge in winter but none of that was taken into account and of course schools were allowed to open without putting any mitigatory measures in place and now of course we're in a position where we are with a new virus strain, which has made these matters worse. But I have to say that where we are was entirely predict- predictable because of failures of policy from very early on, but continuous, because we never actually got on top of it and, and learned from this. Yeah, I mean, Sonia, what do you think, looking back at that period? What If you had to kind of identify running theme or running themes of failure, which ran through what the government did and its strategy, what would you what would you say those were in that period? Um, dithering delay and late to everything. Um, I just, I fully agree with Dipti on everything she said, actually. And I think, um, it was predictable and to, you know, to a large extent, what we're seeing right now was preventable. Um, so as she said, you know, we eased the first lockdown before we had testing capacity set up. Um, and then we, you know, over the summer, we encouraged people to mix, you know, I, you know, the eat out to help out the, the, the ten, I remember, you know, one Sunday, the day, Sunday Telegraph had a big thing of go back to work, you know, sort of implying that people were being lazy and not go- going into the workplace. We told people, we sent students, you know, ha- tens of thousands of students across the country into halls, encouraging mixing. Um, and actually, we've seen the rates of rates of cases increase and not just hospital admissions increase from September. Um, so it's not just a recent thing, it's actually been increasing over the past um, few months. Um, we also then eased the second lockdown um, when in parts of the country the rates of the virus were still increasing and then I guess you know the other thing about it being predictable is that you know we knew that we were going to have more pressures on the you know because of winter than we did in the first surge on the NHS Um, and then also yes this new variant you know it is um, more infectious but again we knew that we it was very scientists have been warning from the start that this virus will evolve there will be new variants and and the new variants that survive are the ones that are more infectious because that's they they will evolve to be more infectious because that's how the virus survives so all of these things you know were predictable um and again you know the 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 past week and the past two weeks and this the you know the huge number of cases that we're seeing in london if you think about when people caught this virus and the people get admitted now to hospital they would have caught the virus um at the start of december um 
and that was a time which I remember when people were being encouraged people to go out shopping and um, we were told we we're going to have Christmas um, and you know I remember the shopping centers were packed um, so you know I guess it's just been it's been it's been incompetence it has been um, just poor decision making and, and just complete lack of foresight and the thing that frustrates me the most is that we are making the same well not we the government is making the same mistake again so you know we need right now I saw I saw you know the Prime Minister have an interview this morning on, with Midma and um, and again it's like it's all it's so obvious right now you know cases are increasing hospital emissions are increasing death rates are increasing every day and yet he's still is failing to act. Um, and again, we're gonna lose, you know, we're gonna lose, he, and event, eventually he'll end up doing what needs to be done because he'll have, have no choice, but he's gonna have wasted, you know, a week, two weeks, which we know will cost unnecessary lives being lost. And that for me is the most frustrating thing. I think you can, I think you can forgive it in the first instance and um, because it, you know, it was new, it was a new virus um, and the government weren't prepared, but to make that same mistake, you know, 10 months down the line, when we know what the consequences are of failing to act, I think is is utterly, you know, unforgivable and, and horrific, to be honest. I mean, Dixit, in terms of, you know, and, and just to, to, to underline what's just been said as well, it was eat out to help out, which was much lauded by the media at the time. It's just kind of economic, act of economic genius. And then later a study found that it was responsible for up to a sixth of COVID clusters in the country. Who would have thought about putting lots of uh, people in indoor confined spaces uh, with... <laughs> And a highly infectious virus on the rampage that that would cause a problem, uh, and and of course similarly, of course that front page of the Daily Telegraph go back to work or face losing your job. The university and college union back in August warned of sending them, uh, over a million students who obviously travelled from every part of the country to every other part of the country and warned about that driving a second wave. And lo and behold, in September. Huge numbers of students, of course, were self-isolating in on mass in campuses across the country. Uh, University of Manchester students woke up to find their fees were being spent on an eleven thousand pound fence uh, to keep them in. Just ludicrous, just ludicrous. Um, I mean, Deetsy, just in terms of, uh, I mean, there's a question here which I think is quite important to raise because I think actually this was an unfortunate article, maybe in the New York Times. I think it's important to raise this just because uh, it says here, what are the implications of the mix and match approach to vaccines? It suggested in the New York Times that vaccines uh, were being mixed uh, and matched, and that was against the science. But actually, and it's important, I think, to reassure these, but as far as I'm aware, that isn't the practice which is currently being unveiled. But I'll, 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 I'll let either of you both answer that. But as well as that, I mean, I mean, all the way through, there was this optimistic rhetoric, wasn't there, of... Uh, by by Easter, by summer, by Christmas, it'll all be over. Very first world war. We all know how how that one panned out. I mean, what impact do you think that's had? And if you've got anything to say on that vaccine mix and match as well? Yeah, I mean, the impact of this is essentially that it's failed to convey the seriousness of the pandemic continuously because you've always said it'll be over by December. Now it'll be over by Easter. And we've gone through repeated cycles of raising expectations and then letting the public down. Um, and that's had a huge impact on public trust and morale and their ability to sort of collectively respond to the pandemic. Um, and, and something I don't know enough to comment on, but I am really concerned about is how much this false optimism has impacted other aspects of government work and planning, for example, long term planning uh, around the economy, around uh, Brexit, for example. So, uh, you know, we know that public trust is the key part of pandemic response because we are essentially relying on the public to, you know, socially distance, to follow particular guidelines in order to stop or prevent infection. And if that trust is damaged, that really, really scuppers our ability to respond to the pandemic. And, you know, we've had repeated promises right from millions of antibody tests being a huge game changer to testing capacity reaching 100,000 in March, then 500,000, then Operation Moonshot, you know, the idea that this would be over by December, now the idea that vaccines will bring an end to this by Easter. And I think all of that has been hugely damaging and continues to be. Uh, regarding the point about vaccination, so um, the New York Times article is slightly misinterpreted. I understand the concern about this because I think it arises from complete lack in trust in government. I think what the government document actually said was that if uh, a person is unable to remember what vaccine they were given and if the second dose of vaccine is not available in very exceptional circumstances, uh, a 
a different vaccine might be used. And that's consistent with even recommendations from the CDC, because if you cannot ascertain what vaccine was used or in the exceptional circumstance that a second vaccine is um, not available for the same time, then it's better to give a second dose of another vaccine than no dose at all. The problem is that, you know, when we see government documents like that, because there is very little trust in government, I guess nobody's clear what exceptional circumstances means and whether that will be misused in a particular way. And I completely understand that because of where we are right now. Um, I think the Public Health England has clarified that that is not a strategy that they're planning to use. It's only going to be used in those particular circumstances where uh, doses have run out and they have a choice between not giving a dose at all or giving a different dose. Uh, sci from a scientific perspective, there is currently not any data on a mix and match strategy. And as a scientist, I wouldn't recommend it, except of course, in those exceptional circumstances, which means that somebody wouldn't get a dose if that wasn't done. I think it's really important as well, because one thing needs to be pushed back on is anti-vaxxer sentiment and anything that might accidentally fuel that. And Sonia, just to, let's talk about just before we finish by looking at where now and what, what needs to urgently be done. In terms of the kind of structural issues in terms of why this pandemic has been so severe. What impact? I mean, Britain is a very unequal society. It's one of the most unequal societies in the Western world, and it has very acute levels of health inequalities. We know we can see that in terms of gaps in life expectancy, but we can also see it in terms of um, underlying health conditions, which I have been totally misconstrued by lots of people during this pandemic. It, lots of people think it means at death's door. It doesn't, of course. Millions of people have underlying health issues, and we know they are linked to poverty. They're more likely to affect people of colour, people who are working class, and the intersex section between between those both. So, I mean, what, what impact has that made, do you think, in Britain? Just so many people having health, in you know, the health inequalities, and so many people having, you know, in poorer communities, health conditions, which make the pandemic more severe? Yeah, I think this is something that has been maybe overlooked. Um, but I guess, you know, UK as, a, you know, the public health experts, you know, often say UK to be the sick man of Europe. Um, and what they mean by that is actually we have, as you said, we have um, really high rates of health inequality. Um, and that, so when we say health inequality, we mean the gap in health between the richest and the poorest in society. Um, and that gap has been widening over the past decade. So um, um, so we're seeing more and more people um, in our, in the, who live in the poorest parts of the country um, and in our poorest communities having poorer health, um, dying at a younger age, um, but also, you know, crucially having health problems and having poor health at a much younger age. Um, and our average health life expectancy, so the average, the average age in which in this country and on when you will start to have health problems and comorbidities, which of course put you at risk of dying from COVID, um, is much younger than the majority of European countries. So we're sort of at the bottom of the league tables in Europe um, amongst healthy life expectancy. And that's because um, a significant part of our population, the poorest part, poorest communities, have ha, do have poor health and have um, comorbidities, um, and we've seen this play out. You know, in COVID, if you look at um, the deaths from COVID, it, it is predominantly impacted, um, as you said, pe you know, um, people of colour um, and those in you know in the lowest socioeconomic groups, so the, those in the in the poorer communities, and also if you look at if you look at geographically as well, it is the poorest parts of the countries as well that have been impacted the most um, with death and with mortality rates from COVID. Um, so, you know, and it's, <laughs> it's, we know, we know why um, it's, you know, a decade of austerity policies that have got us into this place, um, you know, and, and that's, if that's the public health communities, um, you know, conclusion. And I think if you, if you want to know more about this, if you read Michael Marmot, um, has just produced a report, um, and he's been talking about this for a long time. Um, but he's, a, you know, he's a professor, and it's it's pretty stark. It's a pretty stark place. I think, you know, if you think about that, we live in a country where where people's social conditions um, and poverty is literally making people sick and make them, you know, premature to death. Um, and it's, that's something that's been getting worse and worse over recent years as well. And that's something that I think hasn't been given enough attention by the media. I don't think. Um, and it needs, yeah, it needs more attention. And DMC, what do you think about that in terms of those under, those structural issues? And also, and I'll, I'll ask Sonia after this again, but in terms of the impact of 
policies in the NHS. I mean, we started in England this pandemic with uh, 40,000 nurse vacancies, for example, and the government only U-turned at the end of last year in terms of the nurse bursaries, which were, which were cut. Yeah, I mean, 10 years of underinvestment in the NHS has left the NHS on its knees and not able to, you know, not, not have any resilience or space to respond to a pandemic even before this hit. Um, and, you know, we know that when uh, pandemic preparedness testing was done, uh, this was really highlighted and the UK system was shown to be unprepared, but no action was taken uh, to correct this. So, uh, you, you know, this has fallen, um, so this has clearly not only worsened inequalities, but um, uh, the policies have also really scuppered the pandemic response in this regard. So for, for example, um, the current, we know, for example, that compliance with isolation in the UK has been a huge problem throughout the pandemic. And the government has generally blamed the public for this, put in mandatory fines for the public, uh, reduced the period of isolation, none of which actually would reduce infection. Um, we know that uh, the statutory sick pay and COVID isolation pay in the UK is the lowest within the OECD. So these sort of policies requiring people to isolate and then penalizing them for not being isolated because they don't have financial support has really worsened the inequality that we are seeing in, in every regard. And you know we're seeing the same thing with schools now. Um, the government didn't really invest in supporting schools with rota teaching or remote teaching early on. We know that investment in terms of providing laptops to students was actually cut rather than increased. And now uh, we are seeing a situation where, you know, schools are having to be shut down without having proper provisions for remote education and enough support for students and families to be able to manage this. And all this is despite the government repeatedly saying as part of the manifesto that part of their um, the strategy was to level up and we're not really seeing any of that happening. It's very clear that COVID policies in the UK are, are some of the worst in terms of welfare support for people and have actually really uh, worsened inequalities rather than trying to improve them. And COVID is actually a marker of inequalities. We know that the biggest protection from COVID is at essentially wealth. Mm. Um, before we just finally end on on where next um and do do put in your super chats about that and i'll put his put them put them to the guest but i mean in terms of sonia in terms of working in the nhs what has been the impact of the policies of the last of the last few years on the nhs i mean it had a the biggest squeeze as a proportion of gdp uh for for many years of course the lack of uh of nurses the demoralization of of so many staff what impact has that had yeah, so I think we went into this pandemic having had the worst winter in the NHS um, on record. If you look at things like waiting times, um, if you're looking at staff shortages, um, and just the sort of, you know, a few stats in it. Before the pandemic, there was a survey done of GPs, and I think it was three out of five um, said that they were planning on leaving the NHS and leaving leaving their occupation within the next five years. Um, so high rates of burnout, high rates of fatigue, um, and I guess, you know, the feeling, I I think it's, um, and this was before the pandemic, I think there was a often a feeling that you're just firefighting um, and you are, because you're under such strain, um, because the resources are not there, because the staffing levels are so insufficient, um, there is that feeling that you're just not able to give the patients, your patients, the care um, and the dignified care that you want to give and that you're trained to give. And I think that's what makes it, that's what puts so much strain um, and causes so much stress on healthcare professionals and, and staff in the NHS. Um, so that was pre-COVID, um, you know, and I, I'm guessing if you were to, um, you know, ask staff now how they're feeling, I think it would be a lot worse. Um, what was your, I forgot your second part of the question. <laughs> oh, just in terms of the, the policies that have hit the NHS in terms of, you know, the, the cuts, the real, the, 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 the nurse vacancies, that kind of thing. Yeah, so, so we've had, we've had 10, 10 years of underfunding. Um, and I guess what I personally find quite frustration, frustrating is, you know, particularly in the past few years, you know, they are, they will, they will do a big announcement um, of, of a big funding, funding announcement for the NHS. Um, 
And actually, if you look at the numbers, they would be announcing another year of under underfunding. Um, mm. but, the, but the media would sort of announce it as if it was a, you know, a big cash boost to the NHS. And it's like, well, no, no, actually. And there'll be us, you know, on the front line, like, no, actually, if you look at the numbers, that's less money than what the NHS needs just to survive. Um, so then, so the media putting it out and the public believe that the NHS is being, the money is being thrown at the NHS. And actually, no, you know, we've year after year after year, the NHS is being underfunded um, and not being given enough money to just, just to survive and keep things afloat. Um, and we've seen, you know, the consequences of that. We've seen the consequences of that over the past few months where um, we've just had no spare capacity. When I'm talking about beds, resources, staff, no spare capacity to deal with this um, deal with this pandemic. And, you know, a pandemic, we knew a pandemic was going to happen. You know, it's been high up on the risk register. We, you know, it's, and we've had um, the, you know, as Dipti said, they, they did exercises of preparedness which showed the NHS was not prepared um, and the government ignored those warnings. So um, the, the answer to your question is, yes, the past 10 years of policies left the NHS in a very difficult position where we have really struggled over the past few months um, and we will continue to struggle. And a lot of um, indirect harm and consequences and many lives have been um, lost, but also, you know, many people are suffering right now because of things being cancelled because they've not been able to get the care that they need um, and this is a direct consequence of these policies over the past few but past decade. I mean Didi, I mean going forward but also looking at kind of what's informed the government's approach in the past there's been this sense of well actually these are very damaging policies for the economy that if you lock things down Inevitably, that has a huge economic impact. People lose their jobs. Businesses go to the wall. It's so easy for those of us who, you know, who aren't going to suffer those consequences to, you know, to use our platform to say, shut things down, shut things down. But those people suffer. So that I'm just interest that di that dichotomy, which is put up between public health and the economy. It's also Borhea have says, why is this? Such, I think this is an interesting one just to, to, to raise uh, a uniformity of opinion when doctors claim to be independent minded or medics more committed to UK government rather than science. So I think it's maybe worth spelling out why there is a scientific consensus on coronavirus, which isn't to do with the fact you're doing... I mean, I know you're you're probably Boris Johnson, a natural supporter of his, so we'll just automatically <laughs> do what the government says, as we've seen in this whole show, just parroting the government line and, for the last hour. But just on those, on those two things. Yes, yeah, sure. So the government has always presented this false dichotomy of controlling COVID and uh, protecting the economy. And all the data from across the world shows this isn't true. This has essentially led them to follow halfway measures of easing lockdown early, which has led to essentially more lockdowns. Uh, they've essentially done much more economic damage by uh, by you know following these halfway measures which actually have uh, led to many more deaths and also not helped the economy at all we know that countries that have done well economically are actually those who instituted either very strict lockdowns early or very strong surveillance of cases to get on top of this very early on so countries like new zealand countries like taiwan um, have had the least impact to their economies whereas uh, countries which have let this spread have had the maximum impact, which makes perfect sense because it has just led to repeated lockdowns um, and the economy is just linked inextricably to controlling COVID. And that's been obvious from the start. Unfortunately, the government has never understood that and still doesn't. Um, regarding your second point about independence. Uh, yeah, go for it. about why there was a scientific consensus on this issue. That is, is it, is it because uh, the government are pulling all your strings? Oh, <laughs> well, I mean, if the government was pulling all our strings, you would be completely agreeing with their strategy. If you look at, you know, even SAGE and independent SAGE and the reports that are being put out, uh, they all contradict government policy at the moment. Government policy has never been evidence based right from the beginning. And I think most scientists have spoken out against it. So if you look at the scientific consensus, it doesn't agree with scientific policy at all. So if we were trying to uphold government policy, then the evidence we would have been supporting or putting out a cherry picking would have been very different than the ones that we're putting out now. Just then, finally, just 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 looking just looking forward. So, for example, Quint Wall says to have an effective response to the new variant, the original, should we model it after countries like Vietnam or South Korea, who have obviously had very effective responses to the pandemic, far far fewer deaths, far far fewer cases uh, per uh, million people, but also a much as a consequence, which just follows from your point, a far less 
uh, harmful uh, economic impact. And what sort of policies do we need now? For example, schools. Now, it's often said, well, what do you mean by... Someone said, um, Kirsty Allsop suggested uh, on Twitter, um, well, what's the... You know, kids are far more likely to be uh, damaged by trampoline accidents. I mean, the problem there, I suppose, is older people. <laughs> but trampoline accidents aren't infectious. Like, older people aren't going to catch a trampoline accident uh, from their... From their from their grandchildren, I can't believe these are the things we have to say in 2021. I mean, what do you what do you say to that then? Uh, you know, in terms of looking forward, you know that that model, the like South Korean model, Vietnam, but also what do we do next, and why are schools in terms of driving up infections in the community rather than necessarily the potential harm to children? So, sorry. You go first. No, you go first then, Sonia, that's fine. Um, I, I think it's very, very clear what we need to do now. I think this was clear right from the beginning, but the new variant actually makes it all the more urgent. Halfway measures do not control this virus. They are not going to help us with long-term control. We need to focus on an elimination strategy. So we need to focus on zero COVID or elimination like New Zealand, like Vietnam, uh, like Vietnam, like Taiwan did early on. And we can achieve this. It needs good public communication and it's not easy. And it needs us to support the public through these difficult times. But it can be done. And unfortunately, it is the only way forward. If we just let this, let this continue, uh, we, we are going to keep seeing surges. We are going to keep needing repeated lockdowns. And this is not realistic. And it's going to harm the public and the economy and cause many, many more deaths. So I don't think there's any choice now. We need to coordinate with Europe to be able to achieve this. And we need a long-term plan, which is something that's been missing from our strategy right from the start. Um, and regarding schools, um, what do we need to do in terms of getting on top of this? So, yeah, I mean, we hear the rhetoric that you described. We heard it right this morning from the prime minister. Schools are safe for children. So I'm going to leave that aside. I'm not entirely sure about that because, you know, we're just learning about long COVID, etc. But leaving that aside, schools are huge hubs of transmission. I mean, this is incontrovertible now. Sage evidence shows this. There's uh, a lot of evidence across the globe and from England that shows that cases have risen substantially in both primary and secondary schools children. And many of us have been asking for mitigatory measures in school for months to exactly prevent the sort of rises that we're seeing now, which have now led to school closures. Um, but nothing's been done in this regard. So yeah, it's not looking at just the risk to children. It's also looking at onward transmission to the community and children transmit to the community. And the more we deny that, the less likely we are uh, going to make schools safer, which is what we need to do. Uh, and we need to do that urgently because that is key to controlling spread right now, particularly with this new variant. Sonia, what, 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 what's yeah. your thoughts on that in terms of the measures needed? Also, it'd be interesting, I'll ask Dipsy at the end as well, uh, just finally, about the vaccine. What, How confident are you in terms of mass vaccination allowing some return to normality? And by when do you think? Yeah. Um, just about COVID and, and, and child, the risk to children, because I think, again, there's been quite a lot of misinformation on social media. Um, the, 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 the risk of COVID to children is, is extremely small. So only a, a tiny, tiny um, proportion of children become very unwell with COVID, very, very small number. Um, the reason, as Dipti explained, the reason why we're calling for closure of schools is because children will trans will pass on the virus and will pass and it will and it contributes to community transmission. But they actually, you know, just to you know reiterate that there is the risk of two children from COVID themselves is very, very small. Um, but I, I, you know, I with Dipti support the closure of schools right now because we essentially don't have any other choice right now because we need to do something to stop the rates of increase of the virus um, and transmission. Um, your question about about vaccines. So um, as first of a question is, do I do I have confidence in the government's ability to carry this out? Um, I guess <laughs> following the past few months and looking at how, you know, how what's, what's a nice way of saying it Um how how underwhelming they were when trying to do it, build a testing capacity. Um, I'm not that confident that they are, that they will be able to um, operationally be able to deliver the vaccines and the numbers that they are promising. Um, you know, essentially, they're saying that everything's going to be back to normal by spring. Um, we need to be vaccinating about 20 million people um, who are, you know, at risk population and frontline workers 
to get to that. Um, I'm not sure that they're going to be able to manage vaccinating 20 million people um, in the next couple of months. Um, and and I guess the other thing to bear in mind that um, so this new variant that we talked about. So the, the virus is, is is evolving all the time. There's about you know, 100 variants right now across the world of this virus. Um, and the risk is, is that um, we have a variant of the virus that the vaccine doesn't protect against. Um, now, the the way to stop, to slow down new variants happening is to reduce the transmission. Um, so if we allow transmission to accelerate in the way it's happening, we will see more and more new variants. And then the risk of us having a variant um, of which the vaccine doesn't protect us against increases. Um, so that golden bullet, which the government think that the vaccine is, that that protection becomes less and less as we continue to allow this virus to um, escalate and and, tra and and spread across communities. So that's why, you know, I completely agree with Dipti that um, it needs to be utmost importance right now that we are stopping the spread of this virus. Um, and the only way to do that in the current situation is to have the, is to have a national lockdown. And of course, um, the basics, which we're still not getting right, you know, testing, tracing, isolating and supporting everyone to isolate, which is still not doing, you know, we're still, I know this from work, my sister works in general practice, and she's constantly speaking to people on the phone who have the virus and are telling her that they can't isolate because they can't afford to. Um, so we're still not getting the basics right. Um, but we need to start getting those basics right. And, and then hopefully, if this government are able to um, sort out the vaccination programme, we then you know, fingers crossed, may start to see some sort of normality by summer. Um, but it's it, a lot of things need to happen, you know, in, in the interim. Um, and currently, I, I'm not optimistic, given the rates of virus that we're seeing, given the increase in cases that we're seeing every day right now, and given, despite all that, the government still are failing to act and do, you know, bring in the action required. Um, I'm not that optimistic, to be honest, about us getting back to normal by, by summer. Uh, just just finally on that, because we've taken so much of your time. I mean, someone's also asked about interferon, which I'm not sure about. It's apparently a drug. Peter O'Donovan, why aren't we using interferon? I should probably put a health warning sometimes just to check in terms of what I'm actually signal boosting there. No offence, Peter, but just to be absolutely careful, because it's very important we put uh, the right information out there with this platform. Uh, but yeah, I mean, just finally on that, Dips, I mean, what, what do you think in terms of the, the vaccine? Because I've, I've, I've spent over an hour of your expertise now and I need to let you both go. But what, 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 what's your sense of when, where things are heading? So I think vaccines are a hugely important part of the strategy, but they're not the magic bullet that they're being made out to be. Um, I think the first thing to keep in mind is that vaccine rollout takes time. Developing immunity with vaccination takes time. So, for example, the government has um, said that their target is two million per week to uh, essentially um, vaccinate uh, you know, vulnerable individuals in the first place. And we have about 22 million people who are priority groups in the UK right now, which means if you consider two doses, 44 million doses of vaccine. So if they were to reach that target, which in itself is really questionable at this point in time, they would only be able to complete vaccination of those groups by June or July. At the rate we're going right now, which is about six times lower than that target, it would take years to to get there um and even so i think we need to remember that um we don't know the effectiveness of vaccines in terms of preventing transmission we know that they prevent uh, symptomatic disease which is really good and in many cases severe disease as well but the uh, level of vaccination required to prevent onward transmission is going to be quite high, particularly with the new variant that's more transmissible. We expect that this might be in the region of 90%, and that's population-wide. We also need to remember, for example, that the vaccine hasn't been licensed in children yet. And um, so given all, all of this, we may actually not be able to reach the herd immunity threshold, even with our best efforts. Also, given that we haven't done very much community engagement to reduce vaccine hesitancy. So it's very likely that outbreaks will continue even while vaccination is rolled out and even after Easter and summer. Uh, I mean, if you just look at the history of vaccination, vaccination has not eradicated, well, it's eradicated smallpox, but almost, you know, no other disease, probably polio in some areas. So, you know, the idea that vaccination is going to magically end this by Easter is not based in any reality at all. 
Uh, sorry about the tech, slight like tech mix up there, but that that was really, really thorough uh, and in depth, and 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 I hope it gives people a bit of pause for a pause for thought. I mean, is there any just finally? I mean, it's very, very important. People are very clear about where things are heading and aren't given false hope. And we've been given lots of false hope throughout the crisis. And the problem with false hope, and I wrote a piece about Professor Sakura, which was like kicking a hornet's nest uh, for the Guardian newspaper, because people were yelling, what's wrong with giving hope at a time like this? And of course, there's nothing wrong with hope per se, but hope and false hope are two very different things. And when false hope collides with a very bitter reality, it's all the more bitter. There's nothing as cruel as false hope. I mean, if there was one hope, which is grounded hope, not false hope, truthful hope, just before I let you both go, what would you say? Is there anything we can we can, we can can cling on to as a life draft of hope? I would say for me, it's two things. One thing is that the scientific advances and the development of vaccination and treatments has been really, really rapid, uh, much faster than many of us anticipated. And that really brings me hope. Um, the second thing is we know that there are positive models for this out there. There are countries like New Zealand, there are parts of Australia, there, there's Taiwan. Um, you know, there are many areas that have managed to get on top of this. And we shouldn't necessarily think in despair that it's too late for us. We know from how these countries have done it that there is a way of doing it. And we know what the way to doing it is. I think what we need is political commitment, a long term plan and good communication with the public and supporting the public. And I believe that we can do it with all of that in place. So I don't think that, you know, it, it's a point where we need to kind of give up because there's no hope going forward. I think we need to change policy completely and dismantle everything and start from scratch. I know it's very hard to do, but I think countries have shown us that it's possible. I mean, Sonia, just very finally before I let you go, what what's your is it what hope would you would you leave people with in a very difficult time? Yes, my hope um, is that I think this virus has shown us how reliant we are on each other. Um, you know, our health and our lives is is reliant on on you know a stranger in the street. Um, and also, actually, you know, I think if in this, particularly in the national lockdown, we saw that actually the people that kept this country going were our, you know, our delivery drivers, our carers, um, you know, people actually often on very low incomes. Um, so I, I guess I hope we come out of this um, as a society that's that that's more caring um, and more kind to each other um, and values all people in society. Um, and yeah, so that's my hope. Um, and actually that we, I think, you know, the, the scientific community have internationally have shown how well that they've worked together. If you look at, you know, just the, the Pfizer vaccine, it had, you know, scientists and companies from different countries all working together. And I hope coming out of this that actually we will um, see more international cooperation as well. Um, and, you know, I guess that, yeah, um, I, I'm saying that, but actually I'm, I'm in my head, I'm thinking that's rubbish. Just look at the past headlines over the past week. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, Brexit Britain. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I would hope that we come out of this sort of realizing actually that of our, you know, our shared humanity um, and actually how our experiences um, in, you know, in the UK are very similar to in different countries. And actually, we are all reliant on each other. Um, and I actually, you know, I hope as well that, you know, with the vaccine, that we are supporting other countries as well um, in their vaccination programs because. Again, you know, even if we're able to vaccinate lots of people in this country, we will continue to um, import the virus if we're not eradicating the virus, you know, across the world. Um, so that's my hope. Shared humanity and, and, and stronger international solidarity. Which is extremely, extremely, extremely important hope to, to, to focus on. And I just want to echo what Elizabeth Marrera here says. Thank you, science and our healthcare workers. And the tragic truth is that if people like our guests had been running the response to this pandemic, then tens of thousands of people who are currently not with us would still be alive. There would be far worse economic consequences and social disruptions that have come to define the lives of tens of millions of people in this in this country. It's a national calamity and a national tragedy, which was avoidable. People were always going to die in this pandemic, but not to this degree. And it's such a tragedy that both of you have to currently spend so much of your time and careers trying to fight back against the terrible consequences of things you warned about, you spoke about and continue to warn about and continue to be ignored. So thank you so, so much. And I know overwhelmingly everyone watching this really appreciates your 
your expertise, not least given how busy you are. And I think it will be a huge amount for people to take away into their community. And I hope people do do that and push back at some of the terrible nonsense that people have been pushing. So thank you so, so much. Huge solidarity in the in the weeks ahead. Um, and it, and it's been a, it's been a big honour. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank no you worries. Take care. Speak to you soon. But lots of love, <laughs> love and solidarity. Uh, wow, that was amazing! Absolutely incredible. Huge amounts of insight and wisdom, uh, and it's it's been lacking. It's been lacking in so much of the media coverage. It's been lacking uh, in 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 the statements of our elected ministers, MPs, and I think you know, at a time like this, these are the voices we need to be hearing. These are the voices we need to be platforming and, and, and signal boosting. And rationally, if we had a rational government, the policy responses would be formed by that kind of insight. But it's it's not. And every time, as has been pointed out, this false dichotomy between economy and public health, when we know and the research which has been done by uh, by Lancet, by the World Bank has shown that those who get on top of the public health crisis therefore have the less least economic damage. And the reason Britain has ended up with one of the worst uh, uh, death tolls on earth and one of the worst economic hits is the same reason, the failure to, to tackle the health crisis early enough and with, sub uh, with sufficient resolve. And the same mistakes are being made again. They're going to end up making decisions like locking down, like shutting down the schools, but they'll take them too late. To, to bring down the infections, to bring down uh, the deaths that are going to uh, are going to result, and and we saw that during the November lockdown, uh, which was taken too long after Sage called for an earlier circuit breaker lockdown. So please do share this video. People need to hear what both of them had to say. It's extremely important. Please subscribe. Go below and press subscribe. Press the notification bell uh, so you'll get videos coming up uh, as they happen next week. We put a lot of work into this. We've done a comprehensive video about everything the government got wrong in this pandemic from the very beginning. Uh, it's a harrowing watch because we've gone through a very harrowing time, but it's necessary that we spell out exactly what they got wrong at every single stage. So I've done I've done that. We've got lots of interviews uh, to come. Do check out on the channel a very eclectic range of people, including, of course, uh, Devi Sridhar, who is uh, the professor at public health at Edinburgh University. Uh, but as well as that, uh, a whole range of people from Michael Sheen, the actor, to Judith Butler. So click on those. Uh, we've got lots of videos to come. If you've not signed up to our Patreon, if you want to help support us as we expand, because I want to do, for example, we're going to do more of these live shows during the week, particularly during this crisis. Go to Patreon slash Owen Jones 84. That will support the team as we expand. Uh, but please uh, join, join us next time. As I've said, we're looking at doing something during the week with more experts, maybe one on schools in particular. Uh, but send in your ideas. Uh, but it's been a huge honor to have two incredible guests. Uh, so subscribe, uh, look after yourselves, take care. It's a difficult time. Uh, reach out to people if you need to. I think it's important people do that. Lots of love and solidarity. I'll see you soon.